Well, good evening to you. Good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. Hope everyone's had a good afternoon. As I mentioned this morning, I'll mention again this evening as well, we need to certainly remember all of those in our prayers that are going to be traveling this week for the holiday. I know we have some of our members that have already left town for the holidays. I know the Pierces are in Ohio and the Pens are in Colorado visiting their family and uh, of course seeing that new grandbaby. I know they were excited about that. Uh, but we need to remember all of those in our prayers that are going to be traveling over the roads uh, this week and hope that everyone has a great holiday week and uh, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you on Wednesday night and again next Sunday morning. As we look at this subject of religious denominations and their doctrines, I think it's important again to note why we need to study this subject. I began our lesson last week by looking at this, but I think it's important that we keep in mind the reason why this study is one that is important. And we find the answer to that in the prayer that Jesus offered in John 17, verses 20 through 23, where he said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Well, since it is Jesus' desire that all of his followers would be united, that they would be one. And certainly we see in the very early days of the church that that's how it was. In Acts chapter 2, we find that in the days immediately following the institution of the church, we see that they were of one accord, meaning they were of the same mind, they were of the same judgment. They were all holding fast to the apostles' doctrine. They were listening to the things that these inspired men had to say, and that's what they were basing their beliefs and their practices upon. But as we noted in the last two lessons that we've had in this series, it didn't take very long for people to begin to deviate from the Word of God. And we find that even before the end of the first century, there were some divisions that were already taking place, some of those even mentioned in the pages of the New Testament. But as you continue down through the first thousand years of church history, you find a continual uh, deviation from the truth as they continue to move farther and farther away from the truth of God's Word. Now remember, and this is another thing I want you to keep in mind as we go through this study, it is not scriptural for us to say that there was ever a time after the day of Pentecost that the church ceased to exist. Now there are some historians that say that after the church fell into apostasy and became the Roman Catholic Church, that there were no faithful churches until many years later on. I do not believe that to be a scriptural view because the Bible tells us very plainly that the church is always going to stand. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Daniel prophesied that this was going to be an unmovable kingdom, one that would not be removed, one that would stand until Jesus comes again. But we find that in the 2,000 years since the church came into establishment, What started as a united body, what started out as one, a group of people striving for what Jesus wanted, to now there are more than 4,000 different religious denominations in the United States alone. And if you look at the entire world, the estimates are over 10,000. And the thing that is devastating about that is each and every one of those believe that they are right. Believe that they are doing the Lord's will 
Many of them believe that their personal interpretation of the scriptures is the only one that's correct. And so they develop this attitude of division. Well, in our study, we have gotten up to the year 1600. We've talked about a number of different uh, false doctrines that arose during those first 1600 years. We've talked about some of the denominations that arose out of the Protestant Reformation. But where we left off is at the beginning of the year 1600. And we are looking at just a brief historical overview of how we got to where we are today. Started out as this one body in Jerusalem with 3,000 added to that body in one day to now over 4,000 different religious groups just in our country alone. How did we get to that point? That's what we're trying to answer initially before we actually get into a deeper study of the actual doctrines that have come to divide Christianity. Well, the first religious group or the first division that we see to arise after the year 1600 was the Baptists. The Baptists were founded by a man by the name of John Smith. And this was in the year 1608 and it was in England. Now, the Baptist church did not grow to much popularity in Europe. Their popularity exploded once it was brought to the United States. Now, most Baptists, at least, let me put it this way, most of your older forms of the Baptist faith are very Calvinistic in their doctrines. They believe in once saved, always saved, meaning once you have become a child of God, no matter what you do, your salvation cannot be taken away from you. They also hold to a view, and this is what has always been interesting to me, they refer to themselves as Baptists, but they teach that baptism is not essential to salvation. You don't have to be baptized. Now, they say that it's a good thing to do, but it's something that you do after you're saved, and you do this as a testament to your faith. You do this to show others that indeed you are children of God, but their view is that salvation is by grace alone. You accept Jesus into your heart as your personal Savior, and he will save you by his grace. But something else that's quite interesting, and this is something that I want you to keep in mind, because we will talk about this more in a future lesson, the Baptist faith is the most divided denomination that you find. All you have to do is look at our community to see how many different types of Baptist churches there are here. And that's just in our area. I'd say probably five or six different ones just in Randolph County. They all claim to be Baptist, but they all have slight differences. The next group is a group that we probably really don't know very much about other than they make pretty good oatmeal. <laughs> this group known as the Quakers, it was founded in England in 1648 by a man named George Fox. George Fox began to make public claims that he was receiving new revelations from God and that these revelations from God were urging him to move away from what he referred to as classical church organization, meaning you weren't to have these independent congregations that function in the way that we traditionally would think of a congregation functioning. No, what they did, they established more of a society-based organization. They came to be involved in each other's lives much more than what you find with many other Christian groups. They would, uh, many of them would even share homes with each other. They would share farms. They would establish communities. And uh, in the United States, they gained this name, the Quakers, even though initially their name was known as the Religious Society of Friends. And this was alluding to that societal aspect. You know, we're not just brothers and sisters in Christ. We're actually friends with each other. We like each other. We want to be with each other. But this name Quaker was given to them actually derogatorily 
by outsiders who would view some of their worship assemblies, and they were known for being very emotional when they would come to worship God. Now, you got to remember, up to this point, most worship that took place in most of these religious groups that had already been established was that which was very formal. You would come in and you would have a set pattern that you would follow. You didn't show emotionalism. You were there to be reverent, to worship God, and and you were not to put any of yourself really into that. It was just ritual that people were going through. Well, Fox came along and he said, well, I've received these revelations from God, and he says he wants us to worship with every fiber of our being. He wants us to put our emotions into it. Well, what came to happen in these emotional expressions, they got to where they had a practice, and this practice would carry over. Um, And we're not going to really talk about this group much because they were a very small group, but a group that you probably heard of known as the Shakers. You know, we know them from their furniture and things like that. But when they would come together, they would claim that the Holy Spirit was taking over them and they would shake violently. Well, outsiders began to see the way that the Quakers or this religious society of friends was conducting themselves in worship and one man made the statement that it looked as if they were in an earthquake because they were shaking all over. Well, that name came to be, I guess you would say, a moniker for this group. They were never officially known as Quakers, but this name came to be what was applied to them. Now we come into an interesting period of time. We are moving out of the years of the Protestant Reformation, and we're moving into what is known as the Great Awakening. And during the years of the Great Awakening... They began to promote this idea that sermons were not to be so much geared toward intellectualism, but it was to be focused more upon stirring the emotions of the people. And so they began to get away from this idea of lecturing and and, and just very stern observance of these worship assemblies. And they began to focus more on emotional appeals. Well, the first group that arose during the Great Awakening was a group that their practice has come to be known as pietism. They derive that from the term piety. And this originated with the Lutherans in Germany in the 17th century. And ultimately what this held was that they desired to have a deeper personal faith. What they found was that they had a deep attachment to the church but they did not have a deep attachment to God. They knew about the rituals of the church. They knew about the worship. But they found themselves just going through the motions. There was no real meaning in their spiritual life. Well, we see that this doctrine has come to influence many different denominations. But very early on, the groups that accepted this mainly were the Moravian, Mennonite, and the Brethren churches, and those are the main ones that continue to practice these ideologies today. And basically, as I said, this was simply an opposition to cold formalism. They wanted to come together to worship God and it be a place of warmth, a place where you felt at ease, a place where you could share your emotions and not be singled out. They wanted to have a deeper personal connection. And in a lot of ways, that's not a bad thing. But what we find is that this simply became a movement among denominations. And many different groups began to adopt this. Well, the second group to come out of the Great Awakening is what we would call Wesleyism or Wesleyanism. This was founded by Charles and John Wesley in 1729 in England. Now the Wesleys, here is something that's interesting. Most of the time when we think about the Wesleys, we think about the Methodist Church. 
That is the main group that is in existence today that traces their origin back to the Wesleys. But the Wesley brothers never left the Church of England. They remained preachers in the Church of England or the Anglican or Episcopal Church, as we talked about last week, their entire life. Well, in 1729, these two brothers, they came to America for the first time. They engaged in mission work, and they found a very fertile field here in the United States. And what they did, they eventually went back to England. And they went to Oxford University, a university that's still in existence and still prestigious today. And they began a series of Bible studies. And in these Bible studies, they would bring together anyone who was interested in studying And they began to talk about certain tenets. And these were things that were foreign in most of the religious groups of the day. First off, a personal faith. Remember, as we talked about with pietism, there was an idea in those days, it's all about the church and not about the individual. Well, they began to say, no, that's not the case. You need to focus upon your individual faith. They developed an idea known as sanctification. We could expand upon that a little bit. Uh, The Methodist Church today still teaches what they refer to as total or complete sanctification. And what that means is that once you become a child of God, and it kind of goes along with the once saved, always saved ideology, is once you become a child of God, you become fully sanctified. Well, what does it mean to be sanctified? It means to be set apart from the world. So ultimately, what they are saying is that when you become a child of God, you become completely holy. There is nothing of the world that remains in you. Well, we know that this is not the case. Once again, this idea of personal holiness. Holiness is a term that came to refer to emotionalism. And something that we're going to see, we may not get to it tonight, but most people don't realize that the modern-day Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement, originated in the Methodist Church. The Methodist Church, John Wesley especially, promoted this idea of a very spirited, very religious group today that follows that ideology known as the Church of the Nazarene. They trace their origins back to John Wesley, but rather than departing from that and taking on this more formal denominational structure like you see in the Methodist Church, they held on to the more charismatic aspects. And as we see there, the two main groups that hold to Wesleyanism are the Methodist and the Nazarene churches. Well, that brings us to the end of the 1700s. So we've talked about the 1600s and the 1700s, and we find that really by the beginning of the 1800s, you really don't see very many additional denominations being formed with the intention of reforming the Catholic Church. Most of the religious groups that were formed prior to the year 1800. They had, at least as their initial goal, of reforming either the Catholic Church or reforming some other denomination that had originally formed with the intention of reforming the Catholic Church. The intention was not in those groups to go all the way back to the Bible, to do away with everything that you do not find authority for. No, their ideology is, I disagree with just a few choice things, And I want to change those things. I want to reform this group back to what I think it needs to be. And so that's why when you look at groups like Lutherans and Episcopalians and Presbyterians, you see so many aspects in their beliefs and in their worship today that are patterned after what the Catholic Church does. And that's because there were certain things that, you know, they really didn't disagree with. But they only changed those things where they had disagreement. 
And so by the time that the year 1800 rolls around, a new movement begins. And this movement begins largely on American soil. And it is what has come to be known as the Second Great Awakening. And during the Second Great Awakening, we find that one of the main aspects was this concept of religious revival. Now, we may not be very familiar with that terminology. You know, generally in the Church of Christ, we don't use the term revival. We use the term gospel meeting. But this is referring more so back to the old camp meeting days. It, began, it became a very common practice throughout the United States for preachers from a variety of different denominational beliefs to all come together and host these large camp meetings. And their purpose in doing that was to bring people in to share the different ideologies and then let the people decide for themselves what they believed to be the truth. Once again, they talked about individual responsibility, how we work out our own salvation, that it is not necessarily the group as a whole, but it's the individual that we need to focus upon. But also, we see that in this Second Great Awakening is the first time that you really see an emphasis upon what is known as the social gospel you see a strong emphasis in these years of churches getting involved in social works, getting involved in helping the needy, getting involved in uh, caring for those who are ill and other things of that nature. This idea of salvation being available to all people goes hand in hand with this one at the bottom, African Americans being brought or welcomed into the church during these years, you began to see, at least in some of these religious groups, a breakdown in the prejudices in the prejudices that had taken place for many years. Now, certainly there were some religious groups that, uh, that continued to practice separation, things of that nature, but we find that during these years is when churches really began to start welcoming people in who were from a variety of different backgrounds. Now remember, we're talking about around the year 1800. So we're talking about 60 years prior to the end of slavery in this country. Well, where it says African Americans brought into the church, guess what churches they were brought into? They were brought into the churches that their owners belonged to. And so that's why you see... Uh, African Americans and a wide variety of different religious groups today. Because if their owner was a Baptist, they became a Baptist or a Methodist or Presbyterian or what have you. But we see that this was really when things started to change a little bit in this country in that regard. But in these years, we find that there was one group that really started the momentum going. It was in England or in Ireland. And you had four preachers in the year 1827 in Ireland who formed what they referred to as the Plymouth Brethren. Their main ideology was to reject denominational structures and establish independent, autonomous congregations. That sounds similar, doesn't it? Sounds like something that we're familiar with. They accepted only the authority of the Bible, but they were very, very strong promoters of dispensational premillennialism. And so they very strongly believed in the thousand-year reign of Christ. They believed in the rapture and the great tribulation and all of these things that really come from a misinterpretation of the book of Revelation. But the main man that was a part of this group, and if you've ever spent much time uh, looking into biblical research sources, things of that nature. The name John Nelson Darby probably has come up. Darby uh, wrote a set of commentaries that have been used quite extensively. And for the most part, um, he's very conservative in his religious beliefs. But we find that this group eventually ceased to exist. It was never very large in number. Well, now let's come back across the ocean. We come to the period known as the Restoration Movement, 
or as some historians have termed it, and I really don't like this terminology, but you'll see it referred to this way many times as the Stone Campbell Movement. The American Restoration Movement, sometimes, as I said, known as the Stone Campbell Movement, really fully came into existence in the 1820s. But something that I find very interesting is while most historians will say that the congregations that claim ties to the Restoration Movement, they were founded by Alexander Campbell. Well, Alexander Campbell did not come to the United States from Ireland until 1809, and he was still a Presbyterian preacher at the time. But what we find is that there were three men who came to be the most well-known individuals in this movement, and they were Thomas and Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone. But there were a few smaller movements that were led by men generally up in the New England states, and these predate Stone and Campbell. And so I wanted to share just one of these with you because it's significant to our local area. A man by the name of James O'Kelly. James O'Kelly was a Methodist preacher, but he left the Methodist church in 1792 because he didn't like the control that the denomination was trying to place upon preachers within that denomination. They were trying to force them to teach certain doctrines that he disagreed with. And so he, along with several other preachers, they left the Methodist church in 1792 and they established themselves as Christians only. But here is why I mentioned James O'Kelly. James O'Kelly influenced the first promoters of New Testament Christianity to ever come to Randolph County, Arkansas. There were three families, the Hicks, Pace, and Cartwright families, who were originally from North Carolina, lived in the area where James O'Kelly lived. They were influenced by his teachings to go back to the Bible and practice just a simple New Testament Christianity. Well, around the year 1800, they began moving west. As they moved west, they came into contact with Barton W. Stone and the teachings that he was engaged in that patterned much of the same as what O'Kelly taught. And eventually, in the year 1806, now you remember what year did I say Campbell came to America? 1809. 1806, those three families came to what was then Lawrence County, Arkansas. Arkansas was still a territory at the time, and Lawrence County was a territory of the state of Missouri, or a county in the state of Missouri. And those three families, they moved very, very close to what we now know as Davidsonville Historic State Park. There was a ford in Spring River just to the west of the current water plant that is there on the highway as you're going to Black Rock. They established a trading post there. They worshipped in their homes. They called themselves simply Christians. Well, we could spend a lot of time talking about that, and at some point, if you want to, we can discuss that further on. But the modern-day congregations at Noland and Bird Hill trace their origins back to that original group. So, when someone tells you that Alexander Campbell started the Church of Christ, we have had congregations of the Lord's Church in Randolph County, Arkansas, since before he ever left the Presbyterian Church since before he ever left Ireland, or Scotland, I'm sorry, to come to the United States. But it started with the influence of this man and his bringing them back to an understanding of New Testament Christianity. But what I mentioned a while ago, the three people that came to be identified mainly with the Restoration Movement. Now, mind you, there's a, different, there's a difference in the terms reformation and restoration. If you reform something, it means that you're simply changing it. If you restore something, it means you're bringing it back to its former glory. The reformers, you remember, they were simply trying to change the Catholic Church. 
to change the things that they disagreed with. The restorers, their desire was to go all the way back to the first century. Take only the Bible. Use it only as our source of authority. Kind of the the motto or the mantra was, speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where the Bible is silent. Do Bible things in Bible ways, call Bible things by Bible names. And so there was this concept of doing away with denominational structures, doing away with creeds, doing away with man-made doctrines, doing away with any type of innovations that you cannot find authority for in the Scriptures. And so what you came to have, you had two groups that really came to the forefront. Those who had been influenced by Thomas and Alexander Campbell, they referred to themselves as disciples of Christ. Is that a scriptural title? Yes. We are all disciples of Christ. Those who were influenced by stone came to refer to themselves as Christian churches or churches of Christ. Now, we are Christians and we make up the church. The church belongs to Christ. So what you found was that for about 100 years, you had a united movement of people wearing different names. They were practicing ultimately the same things, but then around the years of the Civil War, there began to be some upheaval, there began to be some disagreement. The two main things that brought about that initial division were the adding of instrumental music in worship and the utilizing of missionary societies to divide the funds that would go to support mission work rather than congregations being able to choose for themselves who those funds would go to. You would contribute X number of dollars to the society, and the society would then determine how those funds would be uh, dispersed. Well, in the year 1906, and once again, we're doing just a very brief overview. In the year 1906, congregations that wanted to remain, for lack of better terminology, conservative, who wanted to stick with simple New Testament authority. They split from the Christian church, and from that point on, they were known as churches of Christ. You come on down into the 1920s. The 1920s, you had this group known as the Disciples, who became very, very liberal in their belief system. And so you had a group that split off in the 1920s that are now known as the Independent Christian Churches. Now one thing that is so interesting to me is here you have a movement that was started upon the premise of uniting Christianity. Bringing everyone back to Jesus' plea in John 17 to be one. But most historians today say that there have been about 25 different divisions within this restoration movement. And we're going to stop right there for tonight because what we're going to get into in the next uh, next few uh, the next few groups are going to be ones that we look at today and we see them more along the lines of cults ones that have so far deviated from the truth that it's very difficult for us to understand how anyone could accept those things. We're talking about things like Mormonism, uh, Seventh-day Adventism, um, Christian science, things of that nature. And we'll talk about those groups, um, I guess it'll be two weeks uh, when we come together again because we have singing night next Sunday night. But I think that's a good place for us to stop because... We find, and what I want to leave us with is this. One of the tenets in the Second Great Awakening. You remember in the First Great Awakening, they stressed emotionalism. Doing away with just this cold formalism in religion and coming back to a spirited form of worship. Well, you come into the Second Great Awakening... And the thing that was stressed more than anything else was religious freedom. This idea that you have the freedom to worship however you want, 
to believe whatever you want and to establish churches that follow whatever that ideology is. And so during this period of the Second Great Awakening, we see an explosion of new religious groups. And all of them seem to have some type of radical belief system there. And really when it comes down to it, in light of the religious climate of the day, this was radical. Because up to this point, people were saying, well, let's just change the things we disagree with. Let's not change the things that are going smooth. Let's just change the things we disagree with. But the Restoration Movement came along and said, no, that's not good enough. We have to go all the way back to the Bible. All the way back to the New Testament. And even if it's something that people have agreed upon for centuries, if you do not have authority for it in the Scriptures, then it has to be rejected. And so this was a radical view. But this concept of religious freedom is what bred much of this ideology that we've seen of people claiming Latter-day Revelations, people claiming that God or angels or Jesus has spoken to them, has given them uh, new pieces of Scripture and new ideologies. Well, how can you combat that if we have the freedom to worship however we want, to say whatever we want? We see this was taken to the extreme. This idea of religious freedom was initially you do not have to be tied to any type of denominational structure. If you are the citizen of a country, that country does not have to choose one religious group and claim that as their state church. But people use that as a license to go and do what they wanted and to develop followings and to develop churches that would go along with those things. But that's where we're going to stop for tonight. And it may be that there is someone here this evening that when you reflect upon your spiritual life, maybe you find that you've not been doing things the way that you should. Maybe you find you've been doing things that you do not have biblical authority for. Then we would encourage you, just as have, have been encouraged for thousands of years to stick with the Word of God. There have always been those who strive to remain faithful to God. And we encourage you today to do the same thing. Stay faithful to God. Don't deviate from the truth. Don't get carried away by false doctrines. But if you are a child of God and you find that you have strayed from the truth, we encourage you to be restored tonight. Come forward, let us go to the Father in prayer on your behalf. Let us study with you and encourage you. Or if you've never obeyed the gospel, and we encourage you that if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins. Come forward, confess that faith, and be baptized. Have your sins washed away. The Lord will add you to his church, and you can begin living a faithful Christian life. Tonight, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come at this time while we stand and sing.